In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins to God if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together under the principle of freedom so that we might grow in grace and in knowledge without government interference, so that we might uh, glorify you without the Hindus or the Muslims breathing down our backs. And that is the freedom that we have as Americans, the freedoms that you have given to us so graciously. So for this we thank you. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Now today I got a letter. Got a letter from someone who had... Uh, well, this person's from India. And this person is a pastor. And this person uh, decided that he wanted to take a look at some of my MP3s. And right here in my nicotine-stained hands is a letter from the Indian. And he's from uh, some part of India. I don't even know how to pronounce it. But he brought some pictures here for us. And I'll pass them around so we can look at them. But first, let me read the letter. Dear Pastor Andy in Christ, Greetings in the sweet name of Jesus. How are you? I am Pastor Daniel D. from India. Very glad to write this letter. I would like to thank you for the MP3s you sent for me. Thank you very much. They are nice. I heard them and was blessed, learned many things. God is great and mighty. I praise God for, I praise God about you and for using you in a special way in his wonderful ministry. Please pray for me and my ministry. I have two children, four years old and five months old baby. We are serving the Lord in Kachafulapapi Village. I don't know how to say that, but uh, I am praying for a church construction. God has given a small site. We need your kind prayers. I cry to the Lord's help and grace. Please remember this poor man in your daily prayers that God may use me for his glory. Thank you, sir. D. David. And his uh, name is Daniel I believe his first name is David, and then it's David Daniel. D. Daniel. David Daniel. And here is, uh, I have here some pictures of his uh, Sunday school class in India. And if you would, just to look at them and pass them around, and you'll see that our ministry is uh, reaching far beyond our borders right here. And while there might be a lot of negative volition right here in America... It seems to me that uh, in some areas of the world, there's a great deal of positive volition. And there's a great deal of yearning for the Word of God. A great deal of yearning for the Gospel of Christ. A great deal of yearning in which they are not uh, offended by the Word of God, but rather encouraged by the Word of God. And that all comes down to volition. And if you're positive for the Word of God, you will want to learn the Word of God. And if you're negative to the Word of God, then you do not wish to hear the Word of God. And so all the way over in a faraway land in India, there are people listening to MP3s in which they're getting the Word of God. Yet it's so hard, it's like pulling teeth to get people right here in the United States to listen to the Word of God. And that's a condemnation upon our country. The most orders that I've gotten over the Internet have not been from these United States, filled with the people in here, who are not in here, but filled with people across this country who are filled with arrogance and who are, and who are so stuck on themselves that as soon as they get offended, they have to say bye-bye to the Word of God. And there have been people in India. There have been people in island countries requesting MP3s. There's been a few in America, but most have been outside of the borders. 
And they've been humble enough to say, I've learned more listening to this than I've learned anywhere else. Instead of saying, oh, that stepped on my toes, they said, I learned something. It's a condemnation on our country. Especially when a small church like this, and it's small, reaches a greater number of people in a place called India, where there are Hindus and Muslims, and where they don't have the freedom to gather. And this man talked to me uh, earlier before I sent him the MP3s, and he, he was telling me about the fact that uh, he would not be able to preach but for a certain time, and then they would run him out of the town. We're heading in the same direction because if it were up to Baptist churches around here, if it were up to the religious crowd around here, they would ban me from speaking because it's the truth and it's the Word of God. But that was an encouragement to me to see this letter from this man. And I'm going to respond to him and I'm going to send him a lot more books and a lot more MP3s so that he can learn a lot more. And maybe the pivot's not for America anymore. Maybe it's for India. Maybe it's for China. Maybe it's for some faraway land where they are more interested in the Word of God than cheerleading. Where they're more interested in the Word of God than uh, seeking some place of higher learning. Which is nothing wrong with it. But when it takes precedence over the Word of God, you failed. These people in India have nothing. They don't have higher learning. They don't have, well, they do, but they, it's very rare anyone gets to go to it. They don't have anything. They live in poverty. And so the only thing they look for in some cases is the Word of God and they get it. And when they get it, they live happier lives than any American could ever dream. That's because Americans have been getting off track. We think of success in terms of, I'll be the top of my class. I'll be the greatest cheerleader ever. I'll be the fastest runner ever. I will go to college and I will be a nurse or a doctor, etc. Well, all those things and all those motivations are fine. But seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all these things will be added unto you. You must seek the kingdom of heaven first. God will bless you otherwise. And that's something we need to come to understand as a nation because we're blinded by our prosperity. And lo and behold, year after year, our prosperities will be taken away. And your rejection of the word, remember, you have volition. All of you do. Now, you're, you're under parents. Some of you are under the authority of your parents. But remember, you have volition. And you may say, nah, I don't like that stuff. Well, that's fine. That's your volition. But when your father says go, you go. That's part of the biblical thing. And you're under volition to do to follow his orders. And you might not, might not like being here. But I'm here to tell you, well, since you are here, I'm here to tell you, this is the best place in the world to learn how to live Now, now, just look at those pictures. Look at the poverty in which they live. Some of you refuse to look at it. There's a hut. And there's all types of things going on, which is nothing but uh, poverty. And this is exactly how we'll end up if we don't get with the Word of God. Now, I know you have uh, the parents and your parents direct you, and that's the way it should be. And the fact is, well, let's continue here with what's going on in our studies. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 23, verse 27. 23, verse 27. And if you've seen the pictures, I'm sorry, I just made a mistake. Uh, 23, verse 27. Matthew 23, 27. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her? Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her? How many times I wanted to gather your children together like a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, 
but you were not willing. Now, this is the same way we function today in the United States of America. Uh, we have a, a, a large country of believers. And yet we uh, tend to reject the Word of God. Now, what our Lord does here is He talks about His home nation of Israel, the capital being Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent off to her? How many times I wanted to gather you, uh, gather your children together like a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Jerusalem here is depicted as a religious city that demonstrates maximum negative volition toward the Word of God. Maximum negative volition. And all throughout Jerusalem's history, they have, uh, they have uh, destroyed the prophets, made fun of the prophets. What happens here is negative volition opens a vacuum in the soul. Anytime you reject the Word of God, anytime you neglect the Word of God, anytime you say something's more important than the Word of God, anytime you sit here and say, I would rather be watching a television show than listening to the Word of God, you've opened up a vacuum in your stream of consciousness. And that vacuum is filled with legalism. There's no other way around it. You're either going to be filled with doctrine or filled with legalism. And legalism always expresses itself in antagonism toward grace. Now, when you are religious, it is the antithesis of knowing the truth. When you develop religion, it's the antithesis of, uh, uh, of the truth. Religion bullies people. It tells people what to do. And the more you understand grace, the more you mind your own business. And the more you understand grace, the fewer illusions you get about to self or anyone else. When you are religious, the antithesis is true. Religion bullies. And religion is pushy. And religion persecutes. And religion makes it miserable for others. If anyone is under religion, it makes it miserable for all of those who are grace-oriented. Now, I'm sorry, dear. I didn't mean to make you cry. I just didn't, I didn't understand that you had already seen the picture. So, forgive me on that. It, w it was a mistake. We're human. And then in 24, verse 1. 24, verse 1. Now, as Jesus was going out of the temple courts and walking away... Now, as Jesus was going out of the temple courts and walking away, His disciples came to show Him the temple buildings. Now, as Jesus was going out of the temple courts and walking away, He separated Himself from religion. He was separating Himself from religion. And His disciples came to show Him the temple buildings. So, point one, when He departed out... He went and departed. That's a, continuously, that's a continuous policy. His policy is to continuously depart from the religious people. When he went out and departed, a, continuously po a continuous policy to move away from religion. No believer, by the way, should ever have anything to do with religion. Uh, you must separate yourself from religion and you must separate yourself from religious organizations. You think if you just go to a church that's religious once a Sunday that you're doing all right? You are commanded to separate yourself from religion. And if you do not separate yourself from religion, you will be punished from the Supreme Court of Heaven. 24.24.2 And He answered them, Stop looking at the buildings. You see, the apostles, or the disciples here, they are enamored with this building. It's the Herod's temple. It's probably the first time many of them had seen Herod's temple. And they saw this beautiful structure. And they kept looking at it as our Lord was walking away from it. So our Lord had to say to them, 
Stop looking at the buildings. I tell you the truth. Not one stone will be left here on another. All will be torn down. Now what our Lord had to say here was very brave and very bold. And it's hard for us to understand that it would be brave and bold to say this. Um, to give you an example, uh, let's say the Sears Tower is uh, on high alert and terrorists are about to strike the Sears Tower. And you walk up to the Sears Tower as our Lord walked up to this uh, temple and you said, I tell you the truth, no stone will be left from this tower. Well, the authorities would be listening to you and they would be all over your case. In the same way, it was the same with uh, Jesus. Because if Jesus were to condemn, condemn the temple, that was worthy of capital punishment. Anyone who condemns the temple is guilty of capital punishment. So when he says, stop looking at the buildings, I tell you the truth, not one stone will be left here on another, all will be torn down. He had just implicated himself for capital punishment. A very bold and brave statement. So the disciples, point one, something we can get from this. Point one, the disciples were enamored by buildings. And no doubt the temple was beautiful. But that wasn't the issue. The disciples were admiring something that is absolutely inconsequential. Yes, the temple is beautiful, but inconsequential. Then point two, stop looking at the buildings. Our Lord says, stop looking at the buildings. Point of doctrine. What he's saying is, look, the fifth cycle of discipline is coming. These buildings will be destroyed. Stop being enamored by these buildings. It's all going to be gone. It's about time, disciples, you got enamored with the Word of God. And that's what he's telling them. He's saying, you're all enamored with this superficial junk. You're enamored with a temple, enamored with a building that can't think. And you are all... Uh, uh, impressed by all of these things. It's about time you got impressed with the Word of God. So he's chewing them out. Now we move in 24-3 to the signs of a new age. And this deals with the Mount of Olives, of course. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, his disciples came to him privately and said, Tell us when all these things will happen. Now, remember, they came to him privately because they were worried that someone would overhear them talking about the destruction of the temple. And if anyone overheard them talking about the destruction of the temple, all of them would be uh, in danger of execution. So they came to him privately and said, Tell us when these things will happen. This is not given in this context, but it is, all, but it is given in the context of Luke 21, 20 through 24, which is a parallel passage to what's going on here. And that's Luke 21, 20 through 24, and you can look that up as a parallel passage later. And what will be the sign of your coming? This is answered in 27 through 51. That's verses 27 through 51. And of the end of the Jewish age. The end of the Jewish age has to do with the end of the tribulation. And this is answered in uh, verses 9 through 26, all of which is dealing with the tribulation. All of you should understand what the tribulation is by now. Right now we live in the church age. You do know that, I hope. And then when the resurrection occurs, then begins the tribulation. We will not be here for the tribulation, and you can thank God for that. Now in 24, verse 4, we have characteristics of the church age. 24, 4, Jesus answered them, Make sure that no one deceives you. Make sure that no one deceives you. That is through human viewpoint. 
And there's a lot of human viewpoint going around and it deceives a lot of people. And people think they can be spiritual by who and what they are. People think they can be spiritual by using a holy language. People think they can be spiritual by abstaining from nicotine. People think they can be spiritual by abstaining from alcohol. People think they can be spiritual by uh, using a certain uh, code of, of language such as uh, praise you, uh, bless God, bless you, etc. And this is not, this is all human viewpoint. It's not the unique spiritual life because anything the unbeliever can do is not the unique spiritual life. And the unbeliever can give up smoking. The unbeliever can give up drinking. The unbeliever can give up drugs. The unbeliever can have a complete change of lifestyle and if they've not believed in Jesus Christ, they're going to hell. And you might meet people and say, oh, they must be saved simply because they were alcoholics and then suddenly said, I don't like the DTs anymore, therefore I'm going to stop drinking alcohol and drink lemonade, and now that I'm drinking lemonade, I'm saved. And that's incorrect. Jesus Christ died on the cross as a substitute for us. And if it were up to us to make a lifestyle change for salvation, then why would Jesus Christ even have to go to the cross? If we could stop smoking, stop drinking, stop chewing stop going with girls who do, if we could stop doing all of these things and uh, go to heaven, then what would be the purpose of our Lord going to the cross? There would be no purpose. The fact is we're all sinners and there's a lot more sins related to the sin nature than those overt sins of drunkenness, drug abuse, fornication, adultery. There are a lot more of them, including gossip, maligning, and judging. Yet if people thought that they were going to go to heaven based on the fact that they don't, they don't gossip, malign, and judge, most churches around here are hell-bound, and many of them are, because they have not believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's as simple as that. So Jesus answered them, Make sure that no one deceives you through human viewpoint. Human viewpoint, invite Christ into your heart. Human viewpoint, dedicate yourself to the Lord. How does a spiritually dead person dedicate himself to anyone? If you're dead, no dedication. You must learn doctrine in order not to be deceived. That's the principle. You must have doctrine in order not to be deceived. You must learn on a daily basis what the Word of God has to say in order not to be deceived. You will be deceived if you do not have the Word of God in your soul. The subjunctive mood here says that if you do not know doctrine, you will be deceived. Therefore, the answer is to learn doctrine. Make sure that no one deceives you. Subjunctive mood means you will not be deceived if you have doctrine. 24.5 For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. This will occur in the church age. And we've had many people come up uh, even during our times and says, I am the Christ, and many have been deceived. And there are a lot of people in the church age who are going to uh, try to deceive people into believing that they are the Messiah. And usually they simply perform one miracle or they uh, do something that looks familiar to what the Messiah would do and people follow them as if they are the Messiah. Uh, one of the greatest, uh, flu uh, one of the greatest uh, fantasies today or one of the greatest uh, uh, things in which uh, uh, this man is way out of line would be uh, the guy with the, the long hair, um, the guy with the hair, the Benny Hinn. Benny Hinn would be almost like the person who says, I am the Christ, the Son of God, because he never does give the gospel. The only thing he does is bop people on the head, and many people follow him as if he was the Messiah. 24-6, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Take care not to be frightened, because this must happen, but the end is not yet. This is still dealing with the church age. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. That's for the church age. We're dealing with the church age in 24, 25, and 26. Or 24, 6. And it says, And you will hear of wars. Those are outright hot wars. And rumors of wars. Those are cold wars, like we had between the United States and the Soviet Union. Take care not to be frightened. 
too many believers become frightened by history. Yes, history sometimes takes its ebbs and flows, and sometimes history gets bad for us, and sometimes history says we need to go to war, but what does Scripture say? Do not be frightened. You cannot enjoy life and be frightened at the same time. Because this must happen. Wars and rumors of wars must happen. Anyone who goes on a peacenik type move is an idiot because there's always going to be war and there's going to be rumors of war. And people who hate President Bush because we're at war are idiots. There must be wars and rumors of wars and we have to fight them and defeat the enemy and blow big holes in their heads so that they will not attack us. Take care not to be frightened because this must happen. But the end is not yet. What this is saying is you know how many people when they start to see 9-11 and they start to see all the disasters happening around the world and they see typhoons and hurricanes and they see floods, they start to say to themselves, the end times are here. But what does the Scripture say? But the end is not yet saying, no, it's not here yet. This is, these are things that are going to happen. The end times are not here. And a lot of pastors get this mixed up. And they see all the things that are happening today and they might get up and say, the resurrection must be near because of all the terrible things that are happening in the world. Yet, uh, Matthew 24, 6, the Scripture says something different. But the end is not yet. It's not time. Just because we're at war, just because things look a bit sour, it doesn't mean that this is the end. The end is not yet. Now, when it comes to fear and being frightened, anytime there's a war or a rumor of war, we as believers should not be frightened. Second Timothy 1.7 tells us this, For God did not give us a lifestyle of fear, but of power. That's the power of the filling of God the Holy Spirit. And virtue love, that's impersonal love for all mankind, personal love for God the Father, from which comes sound judgment. And then, of course, Philippians 4, 7. In fact, the soul, and that is tranquility, prosperity. In fact, the tranquility, prosperity, that transcends human understanding will garrison your stream of consciousness and proper motivations through logistical provision because of Jesus Christ. So we should not be afraid when there are wars and rumors of wars. That's not a contention for us to be scared. It's a contention for us to use the faith rest drill. There is no place for fear in war or in peace. And if any of you have a tendency toward fear, you're missing out in life. You can't have fun in life if you're scared of everything. And that's definitely a principle. And when you learn doctrine, fear fades away. So the principles out of these verses is point one. Be prepared for war. This is nationally. Nationally, be prepared for war so that no one dare attack you. If you're prepared for war, if you have your military built up to such a state uh, that it would uh, scare others, they wouldn't dare attack you. There was a time in the 1980s no one would have dare attack the United States of America because we were ready militarily. And then on 9-11, because we had eight years of a different administration who allowed terrorist attack after terrorist attack, and as some of you might not know this, 1993 the World Trade Center was attacked and bombed, both of them. And they didn't fall, but they were bombed. And then we had the bombing of uh, one of our ships out in the Middle East. And we had the bombing of the Kobar Towers, which we owned in Africa. And we had bombing and bombing and bombing, yet everybody turned a blind eye to it and said, Oh, well. Then on 9-11, every, everybody woke up. And that was when we got enough gall to go back and go after the enemy. But during that time, we weren't prepared for war, so we kept getting attacked. But when you are prepared for war, no one dares attack you. And ever since 9-11, no one has dared attack us because we've been prepared and we've been fighting hard. Now, in terms of divine punishment, if our country fails in the spiritual life, God will allow more attacks. 24-7. 
Of course, the second greatest thing, before we keep going, first of all, to be prepared for war so that no one dare attack you. Second of all, have a large pivot of mature believers so that God can shield us from attack. And God right now is shielding us from attack because there are enough people who have grown in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that they have enough impact on this country so that we haven't been overthrown. And that is called Pleroma Tutheu. We really don't have a pivot anymore. And I alluded to something called Jeshurun on Sunday. Jeshurun is the Old Testament of uh, Moses, Caleb, and Joshua. And Moses, Caleb, and Joshua were able to keep together two million born-again believers even though our Lord said, Moses, wipe them out. Moses begged the Lord and said, no, don't wipe them out. And so our Lord didn't wipe them out because there was Mo Moses, Caleb, and Joshua in which there was enough of Jeshurun people in which that country could survive. And now in the church age, it's Pleroma Tutheu, meaning the fullness of blessing of God. And for those who have reached Pleroma Tutheu, that's the reason why the storm clouds of the fifth cycle of discipline have been held back. And if ever we lose that pleroma to theu, the tears will flow from all of us, including myself, because it will be a painful, painful time in which we watch our nation crumble. 24-7, nation will rise up in arms against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in many places. All these things are the beginning of birth pains. What this means is simply this. I want you to get this down because you are going to come across some false doctrines in between here and there. And I want you to understand that all these things are the beginning of birth pains. I want you to understand that these are general and they are common to history. Earthquakes are common to history. Famine is common to to history. War is common to history. Kingdom against kingdom, nation against nation is common to history. Famines common to history. Earthquakes common to history. All of these things are common to our history. What I'm saying is, just because you hear of an earthquake in Asheville, and just because you hear of an earthquake in Maine, and just because you hear of an earthquake in uh, California, and just because you hear that uh, the Iranians might shoot a nuclear bomb at us, that does not mean we're in the tribulation. These are common. These are wars and rumors of wars that will happen, and earthquakes and everything else will happen. They've happened since the resurrection of our Lord, and they'll happen until the resurrection of the church. All of this is part of church history, and it doesn't mean that the end is near. In fact, if anyone could say the end was near, it would be in the Middle Ages when men lived to be 40 and women lived to be 45 and diseases ran rampant and one-third of the European earth was wiped out by disease. They would surely think that the end was near. But that's not the end of times. We don't know when the resurrection is going to occur. It could occur tonight. That would be wonderful. Or it could occur a hundred years from now. It's God's omniscient decision when that will occur. And it's not for us as church age believers to be guessing when the resurrection is going to occur. If all of us get into the idea of the guessing game and trying to guess when the resurrection will occur, we will miss the most important spiritual life that God has ever given to us. We will miss the ten problem-solving devices. We will miss the two power options, the three spiritual skills, the four spiritual mechanics. We will miss how to use the faith rest drill because we'll be thinking in terms of what's going to happen in the future and our Lord tells us specifically we must live one day at a time. And you can't live one day at a time if you're trying to track when the resurrection's going to occur. And that's a false doctrine, and it's something that Hal Lindsey and a lot of others have screwed up in which they've taken a lot of people astray from the Word of God. 
But there will be four signs of the end of the age that we will take down. And this is dealing in the tribulation only. This is after the resurrection. There are no signs for us. We could be resurrected now. And in about two minutes, the Lord could sound the trumpet, or Gabriel could, and poof, we'd go to be with the Lord. It could happen, or it could happen tomorrow morning, or it could happen years from now. But the tribulation definitely has signs. This is not an age of signs and wonders, because remember what our Lord said about signs and wonders. He said, an adulterous generation seeks signs and wonders. We're not to seek signs and wonders. We have the most unique spiritual life ever. Why seek signs and wonders? Just live our spiritual life. So the four signs of the ends of the age. 24-9. Then, and that is when the end of the age comes. Then they will deliver you into tribulation and will kill you. You will be hated by all the nations because of my name. This is also found in Revelation chapter 12. Now this is dealing with the tribulation, not with the church age. Then in 24.10, Then the many, and this is referring to Jews, Then the many will receive offense from each other, and they will betray and hate one another. And what this means is that Jew will rise against Jew in the tribulation. And it's one of the oddest things ever. But mostly it's dealing with the fact that the racial Jew is going to rise up against the regenerate Jew. What does that mean if you're regenerate? Born again. So the Jews were, the Jews that are born again are going to be attacked by their fellow Jews who are not born again. They are racial Jews. They haven't believed in Christ. And they will attack those Jews who have believed in Christ. So, and then the many Jews will receive offenses from each other, unbelieving Jews attacking believing Jews, and they will betray and hate one another. Then in 24.11, and many false prophets, and these will be Jewish prophets. This is the tribulation, remember. And many false Jewish prophets will appear and deceive many. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many. 24.12, this is very important for us to understand as church age believers. It will be very important for them to understand in the tribulation. And because ignorance of the word of God will be prevalent. Well, that's the way it is today. And the indication is ignorance of the Word of God is going to be prevalent in the tribulation as well. And because ignorance of the Word of God will be prevalent, the love for God of many, and we're talking about born-again Jews, the love, of, the love for God of many born-again Jews will grow cold. Remember the lukewarm believer of Revelation? Well, these people started out hot, but they're going to grow cold. And they're going to be in the tribulation under the most dire of circumstances. We can't even fathom some of the terrible things that are going to happen to them, yet they grow cold to the Word of God. And and why? Ignorance of the Word of God. If you're ignorant of the Word of God, you're cold. If If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you're ignorant of the Word of God, or you neglect the Word of God, or you reject the Word of God, you are cold. You are cold to Jesus Christ who saved you. It is that important. Oh, and you'll go to heaven because of His grace, but your life on earth will be miserable. 1 Corinthians 2.16 says we must have the thinking of Christ, but they don't. They have ignorance. 24.12. Then in 24.13, but. And what does but mean? B-U-T. You probably study this in English class. It's a conjunction. And the conjunction too. But but is a conjunction of contrast. It contrasts between the believer who has doctrine and the believer who does not have doctrine. But. But the believer who endures to the end, that is, through Bible doctrine, 
will be physically delivered. This verse is not referring to salvation. I know the King James says will be saved, but it's not referring to uh, salvation in terms of being saved and going to heaven. It means you'll be saved from the physical torment that's about to come down the pike. But, conjunction of contrast between the believer who has doctrine and the believer who has no doctrine, the believer who endures to the end through Bible doctrine will be physically delivered. So we have um, an amazing contrast here between 24.12 and 24.13. Point one, in verse 12, the negative believed uh, the negative believers were deceived and wiped out miserably. We'll see why in a moment. In verse 12, the negative believers were deceived and wiped out miserably. And uh, a lot of these people were smart. But I don't care if you scored uh, the highest score you could make on an SAT. I don't, scare, I don't care what your IQ is. Without doctrine, you're going to be miserable. And they are going to die miserably because the Lord is not real to them. The Lord's not real to them. They've been focused too much on the details of life. And then point two, the believer with positive volition and Bible doctrine survives happily. And the believer with positive volition and Bible doctrine who survives happily may have a low high IQ, may have a high IQ, may be in between might have done extraordinarily well on SATs. What's it matter? It all comes down to, have you learned the Word of God? And that's going to be the distinction. Whether you live or die. Now, this is in the tribulation. And it's going to get... You know, uh, right now, we have the privilege of living in the church age. But in the tribulation, it's going to become so intensified that if you have Bible doctrine, you live you do not have Bible doctrine, you die miserably. And there's no in-between. And that's how it's going to happen in the tribulation. Now, we still have the contrast today. It's not as delineated, but I could just as well say to you, if you have Bible doctrine, you're a winner. If you reject Bible doctrine, you're a loser. But in the tribulation, it's brought all the way down to a life and death situation. 2414. And this good news of the kingdom will be preached throughout the entire world. We're talking about during the tribulation right now. This is also found in Revelation chapter 12. Now there are four methods of evangelism in the tribulation. There's going to be the 144,000 Jews of Revelation chapter 7 who will evangelize. The second method will be the witnessing of the tribulational saints. What's that mean? What does it mean to be a saint? It means to be saved. If you've believed in Jesus Christ, you're a saint. So there will be tribulational saints who will give the gospel and they'll just be saved and give the gospel. Then number three, the two witnesses, and the two witnesses will be Moses and Elijah who come down. They will evangelize the world. And apparently this will be done by television. We have television today, more than likely. They'll have television in the tribulation or some other form of communication in the tribulation in which the two people, Moses and Elijah, will be seen on television giving the gospel. Not only will they be seen on television giving the gospel, they'll be seen on television television getting shot in the head. Then they'll be seen getting up from their state of death and blowing fire out of their mouths and consuming the unbeliever. It's going to be quite phenomenal. Uh, We'll be in heaven, so we won't get to see this uh, uh, television show. But I'm sure sure it's going to terrify uh, everybody watching it. It'll be the talk around the water cooler the next day. So the three, then there are three, point three, the two witnesses will evangelize the world. And four, we have the angels at the end of the tribulation who will evangelize. Actually, angels will come down and evangelize the world. And they will be a testimony to all nations, including Gentile nations. And then the end will come. And that is the end of the tribulation. And then the end will come, the end of the tribulation. 
Now, point one. Now, we have gospel here. Uh, let's get this down because we need to understand something about the gospel and how, well, sometimes some scholars have gotten a hold of this and have freaked out. You haven't because you don't study it in depth enough to where you would freak out. But these scholars have Operation Overthink in which they overthink something all the time. So what they did, and, and what they did is they read 24.14 and said, this, and this good news of the kingdom. So what they said, and this gospel of the kingdom. And, and that hung them up a bit because they're, they're saying, what do you mean the good news, the gospel of the kingdom? You know, we've had the gospel of Christ, the gospel of everything else. What do you mean the gospel of the kingdom? And they had a hard time with it. But it's very simple and we'll take some points down uh, regarding the different gospels. And there are many different Gospels, but they all relate to the fact of faith alone in Christ alone. Uh, nothing special about that. So point one, the word Gospel is in a genitive case construction. That is in 2414. The word Gospel is in a genitive case construction. Good news of the kingdom is what it says. The Gospel of the kingdom is the same gospel. There's nothing different about it. And a lot of the uh, people who have studied this have tried to think, maybe there's something different about the gospel of the kingdom. No, it's the same gospel. It is the gospel with a modifier on it to explain it in its context. There are various types of modifiers throughout Scripture. The modifier is just a word, like they add an adverb to it, or an adjective, it would modify the meaning, but uh, the, the noun has the same meaning, faith alone in Christ alone, but it's dealing with different situations. For example, we have the gospel of Christ, and the Bible says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. The gospel belongs to Christ. Christ is the center of the gospel. Christ himself is the gospel. So the emphasis is on the only Savior. And that's the whole point of the Gospel. The emphasis is on the Savior. Point two. We have what is also called my Gospel. And the pronoun my is added. And that's where the Apostle Paul said, this is my Gospel. Well, what's that mean? Well, my is a possessive pronoun. So when you put a possessive pronoun in front of the Gospel... The gospel's not changed. I mean, uh, for example, I can put it to you very easily instead of this highfalutin terms. There is a uh, 2005 Mustang in your front yard. So you say, 2005 Mustang. And, but you have the keys to it and the title, so what do you say? My 2005 Mustang. Yours but it's still a 2005 Mustang, whether it's yours or not. And that's the whole thing. And that's what it means. So when uh, the Apostle Paul says, my gospel, it's the same gospel, he's just claiming it as his own because he's excited about giving the gospel. So my is a possessive pronoun. So when you put a possessive pronoun in front of the gospel, the gospel isn't changed. Just as if you were to say, my 2005 uh, 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 Mustang or your 2005 Mustang, it's still a 2005 Mustang. So the gospel doesn't change, it's just a modifier. Then we move to, but when you say my gospel, what that means is you're making it your responsibility and the Apostle Paul said my gospel because he made it his responsibility to give the gospel. To let it be known that it's faith alone in Christ alone. And, in a, and if ever in this country people need to know it's faith alone in Christ alone, it's now. So instead of being ashamed of the gospel of Christ, many of you need to wake up and say, this is my gospel, and you need to start going out and giving it. Now, I'm not putting you under pressure to do so if you are shy about it. Learn some doctrine first. If you don't feel like you want to, don't do it. But what I'm saying, the importance of it is, it is your gospel. And the sooner you learn enough doctrine to know that it's your gospel, the more effective you will be in your life in witnessing. Then we have something else called our gospel, point three. 
Our gospel is mentioned in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. Our gospel. And this emphasizes the responsibility of those who possess the gospel. Who possesses the gospel? All of us who are believers in Jesus Christ. And the fact is, it is our responsibility to communicate the gospel of Christ. Some of you are in school today, and school is a fertile ground for giving out the gospel of Christ. And you might be ashamed of it or a little too shy. Well, I understand that, but I would rec recommend that if you were ever interested, simply go over here and pick up, and you might have it at home, but just uh, pick up one of the books on uh, witnessing. There should be one over there, witnessing, and read how to witness. And then, if you have some buddies or whatever, witness to them. You know, there, there, there's no shame in the gospel of Christ. One of the, now, my pastor was a bit, a bit crazy sometimes, and I'll admit it. My pastor went way overboard sometimes, and I'll admit that. He had a different personality. He had a personality that I wouldn't like, probably, uh, knowing him in school and such. But he was so... He was so interested in the gospel of Christ that he would go up to his buddies and he would say, Now, you come to church with me. If you don't come to church with me, I'm going to beat you up. But if you come to church with me and you don't like what you hear, then we'll have a fight over it, etc. I mean, it was kind of crazy. But he would get people to go to church and listen to the gospel. And I'm not saying it was right. It was uh, totally wrong. But God overlooked it in some cases. Uh, but that's just how tough he was. He was raised that way to be tough and uh, to take no guff off of nobody. And so, but uh, well, he was definitely not ashamed of the gospel, though. And if he ever uh, gave the gospel and somebody made fun of him, he'd say, all right, let's take this out back. I'll fight you, and if I win, you got to go to church with me. So they'd fight each other. He would win, of course, and they would end up going to church, sometimes getting saved. And it's a weird method. I don't recommend that method. But if you want to give the gospel, there's a wonderful book on it. it tells you exactly how. And when you do give the gospel, always focus on Jesus Christ. They might want to go off on some other, other subject. But you just say, look, Jesus Christ died on the cross as a substitute for you. Jesus Christ uh, paid on the cross for your sins as a substitute. And they might want to say, well, I, I'm a pretty good person. I'm going to go to heaven. And then you say, no, you're not good enough. Isaiah 64, 6 says, your righteousnesses are as filthy rags. You must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved, etc. And you may win some and others may not respond. But either way, uh, the fact is, uh, you want to know if you love the Lord or not? Uh, just think about it. Uh, think about all the people you've had crushes on in your uh, short lifetime. What do you think? Uh, let's say you had a, a crush on somebody named, I don't know, Greg today. I don't know. And let's say, I have a crush on Greg today. Guess what you're going to do? You're going to talk about Greg all day long. You're going to come home and tell your parents about Greg and how wonderful Greg is. Well, if you have a love for Jesus Christ, He's going to be on your mind all the time. And you're going to want to tell everybody about Jesus Christ. And you might in your mind say, you know what, I really do love Jesus Christ. But do you love Him as much as that Greg who you talk about all the time? If you did, you would constantly talk about Jesus Christ. And you would say, Jesus Christ is my Savior. He's your Savior. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, don't feel ashamed if you haven't been doing that. A lot of this takes spiritual growth. And I didn't do that when I was a teenager, I'll be honest with you. But the older I got and the more I grew spiritually, the more that became the forefront of my mind and the more I would rather witness to somebody than just have idle chat. And that's very, very important. So we have uh, the gospel that is being mentioned here. And the gospel is always static. That is, faith alone in Christ alone, whether it have our or my beside it. 
We have the gospel of peace mentioned in Ephesians 2.14. And this is the work and production of the gospel. And that has to do with reconciliation. When you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're at peace with God. Remember Forrest Gump and uh, that old uh, that guy who had his legs chopped off, Lieutenant Dan, and then he was swimming in the ocean, and uh, Forrest Gump said, I believe he made his peace with God. Well, that's reconciliation. Faith alone in Christ alone brings peace with God. And then we have the everlasting gospel. That is what's going to be taught by the angels toward the end of the tribulation. And then in Matthew 24:14, the gospel of the kingdom. And this is the same gospel that we have today. But this means in, in, uh, in Matthew 24, 14, that Jesus Christ is coming soon for the second advent in which he'll come down to the earth and split it and, and split the Mount of Olives in two and form the millennium. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to study this portion of your word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these dispensational aspects of your word. And may we come to understand the importance of the gospel of Christ. And may we come to understand the importance of learning the word of God so that we might deliver our country. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.